this was a session that I uh, personally was interested in having, and I'll tell you the, the case of a patient that uh, made me realise I, um, I would like to have a bit more information on this. Um, and I also wanted to have a panel. I'm quite interested in having a variety of ways of uh, getting information across. I'm very interested in the right thing to learn be, become the easy thing to learn and perhaps the enjoyable thing to learn. And actually, I really like listening to Radio New Zealand when they have the panels. So if I'm on the road and I hear, hear a panel, I really like it. I've been watching CNN lately, watching the crazy Americans in their election, and I find panels addictive because I just find there's, it's that different sort of interchange that goes on. So we've got a panel today, so hopefully they... They're welcome to talk amongst themselves, but if we want to talk with them, I think that there's a chance to ask questions. Um, if you do have a question, please go to a microphone because this, this session is being filmed, and if you don't speak into the microphone, it won't come on, on the film and it'll make the filming. So for those people who've chosen not to be here. Uh, but I'll just tell you the story. This woman, uh, she, she's now 85, and gung-ho on chemotherapy, She's, her desire to stay alive is enormous. When she was about 70, she had a bowel cancer, and she was disappointed not to have chemotherapy. This would be like 15 years ago. Anyway, she ended up having a liver met, and uh, had that resected, and then was sort of thrilled to bits to be able to go on to chemotherapy. She was, she's quite amazing. And then a few years ago, she came to my office, and um, she said, I've had this abdominal pain for a couple of months. And, you know, look at everything seemed to be okay. And did some blood tests and liver function were okay. And we got an ultrasound, and that was okay. And I was sort of thinking, well, you know, what, what else could sort of be? And she said, oh, I want a CT scan. And she had private insurance, and so, uh, and it certainly wasn't the first thing I would have thought of. And I'd be interested to know from the, the panel what they think of that. You know, you've got a negative ultrasound. You know, what do you, what do you do? And I guess I should have been more prepared g given her age. And I'm just getting my head around that people have, can have two, three, four, five cancers in their life nowadays. And I think that's the new world we're all getting into. Anyway, she had a CT scan and she actually had a, what's called a malarian tumor by some people and an ovarian tumor by others. And, uh, sh um, and she's had chemotherapy for that, which hasn't been working and her CA125 is going up. So uh, things aren't looking too good, but she's had uh, 85 years and she's in quite good shape. So it got me thinking that I would like to have a little a session on abdominal symptoms, how not to miss the cancer. Not, not a catchy title, I, I realise, but um, so I've invited our, our guests here. Uh, so at this end here is Adam Bartlett. He's a general and transplant surgeon, uh, lecturer at the University of Auckland. Next to him is uh, Lois Eva. She's the clinical director of gynecology oncology at ADHB, clinical director of, of gynecological oncology at ADHB, honorary senior lecturer at the University of Auckland. Next to her is Alan Fraser. Uh, he's a private gastroenterologist based at the Mercy Specialist Center. Uh, he was an academic for many years and we shared the same floor. And one of the things if you share the same floor, you, 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 you uh, design research studies uh, over a cup of tea. So Alan and I did a little bit of research before we were sent to Graft and then Tamaki and maybe somewhere else soon. Um, and now he's concentrating on private practice. And on our far right is uh, Dr. Chris Hawke, who's a urologist and laser surgeon. And he first trained in Holmium laser surgery with the pioneers of the technique, the two blokes in Tauranga. So, um, and he's got an interest in extensive uh, experience in prostate cancer surgery. So he's here for the sort of the, the uh, so e each of them here is for their organ, basically. So, uh, <laughs> but I also, I think, uh, and they will appreciate the fact that uh, they get things when, when, when the pretest probability of something serious is getting fairly high. We're in the situation we've got patients with symptoms and the likelihood of something serious is fairly low. And I always say it's like looking for a needle in a haystack and everything feels sharp at times. Although somebody else says it's actually like looking for hay in a haystack sometimes. So the, audio, the, uh, the panel is, 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 uh, has been asked to put themselves into our shoe, but to give us some sort of tips tips and tricks on how, how not to do what I did. So, you know, if somebody said to me, look, ultrasound isn't very, you know, if it's not working, well, then get on to the CT. Stop mucking about the age of 
you know, blah, 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 80-year-old woman. So anyway, so um, hand over to Adam, who's going to speak for a few minutes. Each of them are going to speak for a few minutes, and then we can have a discussion with them and a discussion with us. Thanks, Adam. Cheers. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. This is actually quite a difficult talk to um, uh, give, and uh, part of the reason for this is uh, the fact that abdominal pain as a presentation, to, even to primary um, care, is relatively infrequent. And there's a really nice meta-analysis just being published two years ago looking at um, presentations to primary uh, care with abdominal pain, and it only makes up only 2.8 per cent of the primary reason why people go and seek attention from a general practitioner. So it's the ninth most common reason to uh, present. And then if you look at, well, is, it any, is there anything bad or worrisome, only one in ten of those patients which present as a primary concern with abdominal pain need immediate attention. Makes up appendicitis, diverticulitis, biliary or pancreatic, mainly gallstone probably related, and neoplastic is one percent. So if you look at cancer as a presenting cause for abdominal pain to a general practitioner, it's exceedingly rare. And in most patients, if they do present with abdominal pain from a cancer, it's going to be quite advanced. It's incredibly rare for them to present at such a stage where you're probably going to end up with a curative intent. The next problem is, is the enormous differential. And it's such a difficult thing to try and ascertain when somebody just presents with abdominal pain, what is the underlying cause? And the only real study which helps us guide there looked at a, um, it was actually a secondary uh, level care centre, so like an emergency department. Even in that setting, they get it wrong in 50 to 60 per cent of the time, and they have a whole lot more imaging and uh, uh, bloods immediately available to them than you do in the primary care uh, setting. So to, to come up with a true diagnosis in the primary care setting is very, very um, uh, difficult. I think one of the things you can try and do, and the way I approach it um, uh, with all my residents, is to try and break it down into uh, categories so you can ascertain the, the, so the pre-test uh, probability, which Bruce just alluded to. And when somebody presents with, abdom with an abdomen, okay, they either are pain-free, tender, peritonism, or peritonitis. Nothing worse than being rung up in the middle of the night from a resident saying they got off, oh, they jump on their left foot, it's a bit sore over there, and then they twist this way and they get a bit of tenderness there. You need to categorise it into one of those four groups and say, is it peritonitis? Because if somebody presents with peritonitis, the pretest probability that something's bad going on is pretty high. There's very little else you need to do in order to increase your likelihood of ascertaining your diagnosis. Whereas if they present with abdominal symptoms that they're pain-free, well, you're more likely to probably sit back, reassure or observe rather than go down and investigate further because your pretest probability is so, uh, um, so um, low. There are only four types of abdominal pain you can have. And you can only have visceral, parietal, referred or colic. And I'll work my way through these. What about visceral? Well, there are only four ways which you can incite visceral pain. Okay? And visceral pain is the autonomic pain within the gut. Your whole gut only receives autonomic innovation, unlike the skin, which is somatically innovated. Visceral pain can't localise sides. It tends to be a central type pain, uh, poorly, poorly localised, dull, aching. Patients say there's pain there, doc, but I don't know really where it is. It's just sort of present grumbling um, pain. Inflammation, infection, ischemia or distension is the only way that those nociceptors in the gut can be stimulated. They're not sensitive to, think, to pain by touch or by pinprick or proprioception, unlike somatic nerves. So unless you've got one of those four things going on, you can't incite pain within the abdominal viscera. Distension of a hollow viscous causes colic. That's what colic, the definition of colic is distension of a hollow viscous. Any hollow viscous which is distended will cause colic. We typically learnt at medical school that colic is sort of a wave, comes in waves every now and again. That's true colic, which often you see with re, uh, uro, urological things like renal colic. But biliary colic um, or small bowel doesn't necessarily cause that. All it is is a severe pain associated with nausea and vomiting, and they're restless. The patient can't lie still. They get up, they toss and they turn, they lean forward and back. Those three characteristics define the presence of a distension within a viscous. So if anyone presents with pain and they've got those, it doesn't have to come and go, the pain. It can be there the whole time. But that tells you that there is actually um, distension. It's actually very useful in trying to work out 
etiology of the underlying pain. What about parietal? Well, parietal pain refers to the innervation or the excitation of the nerves on the inner lining of the abdominal wall, the parietal peritoneum, because that receives somatic innervation, differs from the visceral or in the gut. And so once you get triggering of those somatic nerves, all of a sudden the pain is very, very well um, localised to one area. Patient says it's sharp. They can put their finger exactly where it is. And then there's a whole array of different type of tests, such as rebound tenderness, percussion tenderness, jumping on one foot, going over jutter bars to the doctors, which all incite that type of pain. It's different from visceral. Visceral will not incite pain to that level where it's so well um, localised. And lastly, the patient prefers to lie still. That differs from colic. Distension, they won't. They will be restless, where if it's parietal pain, they will want to lie still. You, you don't want, they don't want to move. Well, what's peritonitis, the fourth type of pain in the abdomen? Well, peritonitis is just inflammation of the parietal peritoneum. That's all it refers to. So as soon as that somatic nerves on the parietal peritoneum are incited, you get peritonism. That's what defines what peritonism is. And peritonitis is when all four quadrants are inflamed. So classic is appendicitis. They describe central abdominal pain, poorly localised. That's visceral. It's often due to a fecalus within the appendix. And then the patient de develops peritonism over on the right iliac fossa because the somatic nerves under the parietal peritoneum are incited. Okay? Then the thing will rupture and you get peritonitis. You get more than one quadrant of the abdomen with the parietal peritoneum excita with excitation of those pain fibres. That's peritonitis. What about referred pain? It's really poorly understand referred pain, but it's basically where the dorsal uh, root ganglions converge. And a classic would be the gallbladder, excuse me, um, which uh, has uh, convergence of those phrenic nerves up onto the tip of the shoulder. That would be the classic. The other one is genetofemoral nerve with appendicitis and the retroperitoneum down onto the inner um, thigh. It's, it's helpful maybe in making the diagnosis, but it's, it's more of a, a sort of an enigma which we get excited by. I won't go through this. So we know there's four states of the abdomen, there's four types of pain, there's four ways you can incite the pain, and there's four critical investigations which you need to do. But there's no point doing these if your pretest probability is very low. But this is in the patient where you say, oh, they look sick, there's something going on here. Those are the four critical things which need to be done at the night or the end of the day before you go home and sleep. And most patients, if these come, you do these tests and they come back normal, you can sit on them and worry about and observe, come back and see them four to six an hour later. Full blood count gives you white cell count as well as a haemoglobin. Amylase, because pancreatitis is such a difficult thing to make a diagnosis on because of its position of the inflammation. Midstream urine, beta HCG, it also looks for red cells, renal colic, and white cells, and an erect chest looking for free air. And then you've got four management strategies. You either observe, uh, operate and in the sense of primary care, you're not going to operate, I hope, but you're going to refer, uh, reassure, or you investigate. And depending on your level of uh, comfort on the basis of these symptoms and going through what type of pain it is, and if you do have the investigations, you can categorise the person into which way to go from there. So just to sort of summarise how I think about abdominal pain and ask all the people which you know, work in the firm with me, how to categorise it so we can make some sense of the likelihood of needing anything more done. I, I want for the status of the abdomen. What is it? Pain-free, um, tender, peritonism or peritonitis. The four types of pain, is it visceral, is it referred, is it parietal or um, do they have colic? The four causes of it, is it inflammation, infection, um, ischemia or uh, distension? The investigations, which is the midstream urine, chest x-ray, um, full blood count and amylase, and then your management strategy. Do you reassure, do you observe, do you um, uh, operate, or do you further investigate the um, patient? But I think it needs to be kept into context in the fact that, you know, abdominal pain is common in terms of uh, uh, pain. everyone will get abdominal pain at some time in their life, and it's not an uncommon reason to refer to a doctor. But the, and the underlying cause is often very, very difficult to ascertain. You know, even in the hospital setting, we get it wrong more often than we get it right in the first um, setting. 
It's, a, it's very difficult to uh, know the right investigations to do, but there's four critical investigations you need to do if you're concerned about the uh, patient. And I think if you standardise the way you think about abdominal pain, you investigate it and you manage it, then you're, more, well, you're less likely to leave somebody um, hanging without knowing or lose or misdiagnose that patient. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Lowe's. Four things are nice, you can keep them in your head. On my slides. Thanks. So, as Adam said, we all get it wrong. And we supposedly only do cancer, and even the lumps we take out of the ovaries are still wrong 25% of the time. So it's not easy. And this was looking at the problem with primary care, is that you've got to pick out the one or two that have got something serious amongst all the others that haven't. And that's really quite hard. So this has led on, certainly amongst the different tumour streams, to try and come up with some help for primary care in terms of what symptoms that we can look at that increase our probability of actually developing a cancer. And this is the gynae tumour stream. Now, we're all here for our organ. I'm lucky I've got five organs, which also meant that we had to spend a lot longer locked in dark rooms in Wellington to come up with any sort of agreement whatsoever amongst our tumour stream. Because in, within gynaecology, we've got vulva, vagina, ovary, tube, uterus, endometrium, trophoblastic disease, genetic issues, and they all present in five tumours in five very different pathways with different symptoms. So we spend a lot of time trying to work out what all these patients would have if they'd got cancer, recognizing that a lot of the patients will have these symptoms but not have cancer. And it's been sort of fairly um, controversial, I think, particularly. I mean, some of these are easy. So if you've got molar pregnancies, so if you've got a histological diagnosis, then that needs to be referred. So if you see someone who's had a very high HCG with no ongoing pregnancy, we need to think about gestational trophoblastic disease. Some of them are easy. If you've got a big lump on your vulva, it's normally fairly obvious. However, if you've got a lump in a very big tummy, it's not quite so obvious. Um, the main, most common one would be your symptoms and pain in gynae cancer is actually not a big player. The majority of endometrial cancers will present with postmenopausal bleeding. And so these are the, the definitions of the high suspicion of cancer that all postmenopausal bleeding should be considered suspicious until proved otherwise. Now, it will be proved otherwise in about 19 out of 20 cases, but the point is we very rarely see someone with an endometrial cancer who hasn't had postmenopausal bleeding. Certainly in South Auckland, a lot of them have had premenopausal bleeding, and they're, they're a lot younger down here. But um, the majority of them will be postmenopausal. So if you can exclude them, if you've, done a nor you've got a normal smear and you've got an ultrasound that has got an endometrial thickness of less than five millimeters, your probability of this being due to a cancer plummets. So and you can get them off the high suspicion pathway if you've got all these things. But up until that point, then they should be assumed that they are high suspicion of cancer. Rapidly growing pelvic mass, again, they often don't present with pain, they present with distension. And so if you find a, pa a mass, unless the investigation suggests it's benign, so if you find a large pelvic mass, you send her for a scan and it's a fibroid, she comes off the pathway. And also to be aware that the, the BRCA carriers and the HMPCCs will increase our risks as well. So that is the gynae rake flag that should be on all the e-referral pathways and allows you to choose and then goes on the high suspicion of cancer and theoretically that then flags something at the hospital with the triaging consultant and the patient should be seen within two weeks. 
Now, the problem is that pelvic masses are fairly nonspecific as well. So we've got all these things that can actually cause, of which a few of them are serious from our point of view. I imagine they're all serious from the patient's point of view, but from our point of view and missing the cancers, these are the ones that we're interested in. And so the problem with particularly ovarian cancers is there is no one symptom. Endometrial cancers, fairly straightforward. You will have bleeding. Vulval cancers, you've got a big lump on your vulva that you probably will notice. But ovarian cancers, everyone's tired. Everyone's a bit bloated. This describes most women, <laughs> generally. Apart from the weight loss. Weight gain, though, as well. So there you go. So basically, we could all have ovarian cancer because we probably all had this at some point or another, but the point is there's probably about 500 women in the country who actually do have ovarian cancer in any year. So the odds are actually quite low, and it's, your job is to pick out which ones we then <coughs> need to investigate better. And there have been various campaigns that have been tried to come up with the fact that you've got bloating, early satiety, abdominal pain, and go and talk to your GP. But again, it's all very nonspecific. And this was um, the fact that women aren't particularly good at recognizing the symptoms either, because we all assume we're a bit bloated and a bit tired and a bit irritable. And, and so you've actually got the patient to know what they're looking for in the first place. And pain actually comes, they're good at recognizing pain, but it's not a good predictor of the cancer. So that's not much use. So this looks at also the diagnosis pathways of ovarian cancer. There are very few women who go and see their GP and get to a gynecologist. The majority of them will go to gastro, general surgery, back to their GP. And if you look, that the number of this was um, looking at the pathways of women in Australia, and some of these were taking ages, months and months and months. And you've got 20% of people taking four to six months, which can make a difference either between being operable, not operable, or being curable, not curable. So it is very different, but difficult. But don't think that you're alone because this is the problem around the world. And we often get them come through other departments and they've languished on the medical wards for the last three weeks before we actually get to see them. So NICE in the UK came up with a series of recommendations and Bruce had sort of said to me, this is where it all come from, that he'd heard a podcast about it and could we look at this, um, to talk about how you could try and initially recognize it and the initial management. So basically, they recommend that you, anyone who's got these symptoms, you should do a CA125, which basically means doing a CA125 on virtually every woman that walks through the door. But then you narrow it down to women over the age of 50, because obviously your instance of ovarian cancer goes up. The BRCA mutation, so the genetic cancers occur about 10 years before the spontaneous mutations. But otherwise, the majority we will see will be 50s, 60s upwards. So they recommend that you narrow it down to these symptoms, that if you've got persistent and bloating and the feeling full and not being a loss of appetite are the big ones, and recommend that you should do a, a CA125 in these women. And then they've come up with the pathway that if you think that there's an obvious cancer, obviously you send it straight in. The ones that you do the CA125, if it's normal, then that's fine. If it's abnormal, then you send them for an ultrasound. And so then if the ultrasound shows that you've got your pelvic mass with a raised CA125, then you come in. The question is, what do you do then if your ultrasound is normal? Um, so what it then says, if you can't find out an obvious cause for it, then get her to monitor her symptoms and explain what symptoms to look for and come back again. But because the majority of people with, unless it's primary peritoneal disease, which is even rarer, will have a mass on ultrasound if they're postmenopausal. Some of them are obvious. Um, so in terms of tumor markers, 
we would say do a CA125 and a CEA. We know if the ratio of those two tumor markers, if your CA125 is 25 times higher than your CEA, the chances are it's an ovarian cancer. If your CEA is higher than your CA125, then you need to shove them down the um, colorectal route instead. And the 19.9 goes up with mucinous tumors. In young women, we're interested in the germ cells. So these are the germ cell markers, because you can have advanced germ cells that are still curable. Um, obviously, in premenopausal women, CA125 goes up with a whole variety of things, and it's not nearly as specific. So that's why we've decided on the cutoff of age 50. It also only goes up in 50% of age 1 tumors, and it doesn't go up in mucinous tumors so much. In terms of your genetics, if you're a BRCA carrier, then you've got a much, much higher, even over 50% chance of developing an ovarian cancer. So if you've got someone who's got a strong family history, who has or hasn't been tested, then that should increase your suspicion. The HNPCCs increase your bowel a little bit, the Lynch syndrome, um, your ovary a little bit rather, um, but it's your endometrial cancers that are a higher risk for the, for the HNPCCs. So in terms of working out the risk, RMI, the risk of malignancy index, these are the um, calculations that you can use. And we know that if you've got a, a risk that's more than 200, then that increases your prediction of it being an ovarian cancer. So in conclusion, you need to think about it if they're vague symptoms, but you can then narrow it down with a mixture of ultrasound and CA125, both of which are relatively easily available in the community. Do a vaginal examination, you will pick up about 50% probably at best. Um, and if they're high risk, then we would want to see them. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Next speaker is uh, Alan Fraser, gastroenterologist. Thank you. I think all of us uh, found this uh, topic rather difficult. Next slide, please. Because uh, Bruce has started off with abdominal pain, uh, how not to miss the cancer, and then all of us perhaps complained a bit that abdominal pain is such a late symptom. And if you've got abdominal pain, particularly with weight loss, it, it's bad with uh, the abdomen. Uh, and we're all looking at symptoms, you know, what are some particular symptoms we can, we can uh, check at. And we all fully understand the problem. When the patient comes with abdominal pain, uh, cancer is high in their minds and it's very uh, dependent on the community they're from, the family they're from, but uh, someone uh, in the Asian community from China, they're thinking about stomach cancer because that's the feared cancer in that community. It was, it was at one stage the second most common cancer in the world. And so people come with their ideas. And of course, from your point of view, the last thing you want to do is, is to miss the cancer. Uh, but I wanted to step back a little bit. I'll, I'll talk about symptoms for a moment, but I just want to see, can we make a difference? And by making a difference, we mean as a population, can we actually do something about cancer mortality in New Zealand? And I don't think any amount of these symposiums and saying, uh, do this and do that is going to make in terms of symptoms is going to make the difference we want. So in terms of the abdominal organs, which is my, uh, the uh, GI organs, um, it's all about bowel cancer in terms of numbers. I mean, in terms of uh, there are 3,000, 3,100 bowel cancer diagnoses in New Zealand every year and uh, about 1,200 deaths. That outnumbers by far any of the other uh, organs, both in the GI tract or any of the other abdominal organs represented on this panel. So. We want to make a difference, it's about bowel cancer. Uh, but we're dealing with very symptoms of very poor predictive value, and I'll discuss that briefly. Unfortunately, for gastric cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, symptoms are late, uh, and we've really made no progress with that, despite uh, our clever investigations. And it's very late for esophageal cancer. So that's, just, that's what we're dealing with. What about, uh, next slide, uh, bowel cancer? Oh, Firstly, I just wanted to say, uh, making a difference. Very important paper in New Zealand Medical Journal last year, just looking at across the Tasman and looking at their cancer mortality rates and, and comparing it and using that for the New Zealand setting, 
showing that there's an excess mortality in New Zealand from a variety of cancers. And the, and the most uh, common cancer with excess mortality is colorectal cancer, particularly in females, 204 per year, 35% higher than expected, and for men, 143. And this outnumbers vastly any other of the abdominal cancers that we're talking about today. So if you want to make a difference, do as good as our colleagues across Australia, we've got to do something better with colorectal cancer. Next slide. So what have we got to work with? Well, you all know these symptoms. Anybody with unexplained iron deficiency should be investigated. Anybody over 50 uh, uh, should definitely have combined gastroscopy and colonoscopy. That's, that's a given, you know that. Rectal bleeding, this is where we get into, into problems. Uh, just next slide. So iron deficiency, absolutely. Rectal bleeding, well, we, we agonise about uh, the type of bleeding. Uh, is it uh, hemorrhoidal bleeding? Was it from a, a fissure or is it from a, a cancer? Uh, and sure, uh, you can recognise hemorrhoidal bleeding quite well often. If it's bright red blood, it's splattering the toilet paper, it's splattering the toilet bowl, it's mostly on the toilet paper. If they notice a prolapsing lump, uh, it's likely to be hemorrhoids. Uh, if it's darker blood, uh, if it's coating the bowel motion, well, it could be a cancer, but it's still likely to be hemorrhoids. The, the fact is that you can actually do quite well by investigating everybody with rectal bleeding over 50. Uh, it has the highest positive predictive value for, for cancer uh, than any other symptom. If we could, that would be what we would do, recognising we're going to be investigating a lot of people with hemorrhoids, but it still works. In much the same way that uh, a faecal occult blood test for uh, bowel cancer screening is highly problematic, lots of false positives, but it still works because we're still, if we're prepared to put the resources into it and do the procedures, you still pick up the cancers. Change in bowel habit. It's just as difficult uh, as Eva was talking about for um, uh, ovarian cancer. Everybody has change in bowel habit. Our bowels are changing all the time. The only change worth looking at is change towards diarrhoea. So change towards constipation is of no value. Forget it. Change towards diarrhoea, it's got pretty low predictive value, lower than rectal bleeding of all types. Uh, but, and it's a change for more than six months, uh, sorry, more than six weeks to, to get you out of the uh, short term change from various uh, infective things. Next slide. Sorry. This is the critical thing to me, colorectal cancer. The five-year survival in Australia is 67%, in New Zealand it's 61%. You might say it's not too big, it makes all the difference in terms of that, that excess uh, mortality. What's that all about? It's all about diagnosis at an earlier stage. How does that happen? Well, it's about having the investigations available. It's not that Australian GPs are cleverer than New Zealand GPs. No way is that the explanation. The explanation is that in Australia, for any sort of change in bowel habit, for any sort of rectal bleeding, you can get a colonoscopy straight away. It ends up that the colonoscopy rate is twice that of New Zealand, but if you're prepared to put the resource in, you can make the difference and all those excess deaths that uh, we're having in New Zealand will go. Uh, next slide. And the only country in the world that's actually having a decreased incidence uh, of uh, colorectal cancer, or decreased numbers of cancers despite an aging population is America. Uh, and the USA have a sort of de facto screening program. It's not an organized one, but almost 70% of the population has a colonoscopy at 50 and another colonoscopy at 60. It works. They have the best figures for colorectal cancer in the world. Next slide. Just a short comment about, so I've made a plug for colorectal cancer. If we're going to make a difference, that's where we've got to put our resource. It's not about being clever in terms of evaluating symptoms. It's about being prepared to do the investigations to find the cancers. Gastric cancer. The, the second most common cause of excess cancers in the paper in the uh, comparing New Zealand and Australia was gastric, gastric cancer, mainly in men, about 30 excess 35 excess deaths. And it's all about the fact that gastric cancer is becoming quite uncommon in the European population. 
in the older group, but amongst our Māori and Pacific Island patients, gastric cancer is still a significant problem at an early age. The symptoms are almost impossible to differentiate from any other symptom. The sort of red flag things that we talk about uh, always lead to diagnosis at a late stage. Uh, as I said there, we have 25 more cancer deaths in men compared to Australia. Next slide. And what's that about? Well, it's about helicobacter rates in Murray Pacific Island patients. They're significantly higher. It's the paper last year looking at cohorts. And so that uh, it's about getting helicobacter as a child. Uh, and uh, as time's gone on, it's become less likely uh, to get helicobacter as a child. But still, in the 71 to 85 year old age group, the group that's now coming into getting cancer, uh, the rates in European are very low, around about the 5%, uh, but amongst the Maori and Pacific Island, still pretty high and probably actually stabilising at that rather than continuing to come down. And if you look at, uh, next slide, gastric cancer, I'll just, just move on, I think, uh, has it got the next one? The top two graphs here for males and females uh, in New Zealand, and this is coming back to 1960, gastric cancer rates in Māori coming down, but according to this, it's sort of bouncing around, and actually uh, it looks like it's sort of staying up at about two to two and a half times that for European men, and the same thing for women. So there's still a major problem with gastric cancer in Māori and Pacific Island uh, people in New Zealand. It's not going away. Uh, if we just go back, go backwards, sorry, the slide's out of order. The only, so early diagnosis is not going to happen. We've been trying, you've got resources available. We're not picking these cases up by gastroscopy at an early stage. The only possible way to do better uh, is to identify Māori and Pacific Island patients in their 20s and 30s and getting rid of the helicobacter. I'm going out on the limb here just to be controversial, uh, but the studies are good. They're in now that actually eradicating helicobacter at an early age can prevent gastric cancer. That's what's going to change this, the situation. Nothing about doing lots more gastroscopies or, or red flags for uh, early satiety uh, and uh, weight loss. It's all uh, far too late. Uh, moving on. Moving on. Just uh, go back. There. Sophageal cancer, just a, a, a brief comment. Dysphagia, you'll get a gastroscopy, even within our strapped uh, health system. Uh, it's just that dysphagia is a late symptom. Can we do any better? Not much better. Uh, we've got the possibility of identifying Barrett's esophagus, and there are risk factors, men, smokers, long-standing reflux, obesity. Once they are identified, the more Barrett's you have, the more the risk. If you have a surveillance-detected adenocarcinoma, you have an excellent five-year survival. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that of gastric, of esophageal cancers, only about 10 or 15 percent have had a prior di diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. So most people present uh, without the opportunity to screen for Barrett's. However, in Australia, they're doing better. And why is that? That's not about early diagnosis. The fact is they actually do better with their chemo radiotherapy. They have access to better services uh, and better drugs. Not a big difference, but 10 to 15 percent five-year survival for, for cancer. The last comment, pancreatic cancer, next slide. Surgeons feel that they can do something, 20% uh, resectable, five-year survival, um, reported from 4 to 25%. However, if you look at the New Zealand statistics, incidence equals mortality. Everybody dies from their pancreatic cancer, it seems. There's very few long-term survivors. Can we do better? Well, Again, very hard to pick up the, 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 the pancreatic cancer where the tumour is less than three centimetres in diameter. That's resectable. Not that often. Can we do better with tumour markers? Hardly ever. Uh, they're confusing, only elevated in half the time, high false positive rate, and, and a huge increase in anxiety. Unfortunately, uh, pancreatic cancer is bad. We do bad. Australia does bad. Uh, it's hard to know how we can make any progress. Thank you.
Thanks, Alan. I have to say, when I've got a patient with abdominal pain, if there's a, a normal colonoscopy within the last 10 years, I, I, I relax. If they have not, then uh, I'm very on edge. Last speaker is Chris Walsh, uh, Paul, urologist. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> It's interesting, uh, our proposition, don't miss the abdominal cancer, we've sort of gone from one end of the spectrum, you know, the acute abdomen to the other, in terms of screening for colorectal disease. I'm probably somewhere halfway in between those two. Uh, pain as a symptom of urological cancer is uncommon, and uh, as Adam said before, it's, it's usually too late. Uh, by the time you present with the classic triad of loin pain and hematuria and a palpable mass, uh, you, you will often have an incurable renal cancer. But it's not a diagnosis you're likely to miss, even if uh, they're a, a big patient and you can't feel the mass, and generally you can't, uh, until they're under anaesthetic on the operating table. Nevertheless, pain or hematuria, you're going to investigate, you're not going to miss that. Uh, very often these days, of course, we find renal cancers picked up as incidental findings on scans performed for other reasons, and that's a very different proposition. Uh, those incidental tumours less than four centimetres in size are uh, just about universally curable. Uh, in fact, we now know that uh, in the elderly, uh, a number of small tumours can be quite reasonably kept under surveillance, as uh, their growth rate, at least uh, in the first few years, is, is very slow. Uh, if you look at tumours around the two centimetre or less range, they only grow about a millimetre a year, uh, a fair proportion of them. Now, <clears throat> missing urological cancers. Well, you will miss urological cancers if you don't examine everything. And uh, the classic example would be a taciturn young man with uh, epigastric uh, fullness or mass, lumbar pain. Uh, obviously, uh, you'll feel a little silly if you haven't examined the, the scrotum and uh, diagnosed as testicular tumour. Uh, but <clears throat> generally speaking, hematuria is going to be our red flag symptom. Now, macroscopic hematuria is a red flag, uh, almost uh, sort of uh, by definition, because around 20% of those patients will have some form of urological cancer. Probably three quarters of those tumours will be bladder tumours, and around one quarter will be renal tumours. Uh, macroscopic hematuria is the common presentation of bladder cancer. Uh, around 50% of people, when you investigate, will have some significant pathology. So there's lots of BPH, there are kidney stones, there's infection, there are other benign pathologies in there as well. Microscopic hematuria is not as uh, predictive of cancer, but, uh, well, I'll, I'll address that in a moment. For a start, is it a UTI? If the, if the symptoms and the presentation would suggest it may be an infection, even if the urinalysis is a little equivocal, there's probably not a lot of harm in treating and repeating that urinalysis, say, in a couple of months' time. Now, around 10% of patients with microscopic hematuria will have a nephrology rather than urology cause for that, and uh, unfortunately, proteinuria has dropped off lab tests uh, screening now. They don't do dipsticks anymore. Uh, they've put that back to you. And so uh, if your patient's older, diabetic, hypertensive, uh, has any other reasons to suspect intrinsic renal disease, uh, red cell casts, then check that out. Microscopic hematuria. It would be nice if we could in some way dismiss that, but we can't, because around 5% of patients will still have cancer. It's not as predictive as macroscopic, but it still warrants investigation. This is a study of uh, 19, over 1,900 patients, and just to uh, point out a few things. In women younger than 40 with microscopic hematuria, no cancers. In males under 40, and, and we're talking big numbers here, uh, you know, 900 odd patients, uh, one cancer. So that is helpful. Macroscopic hematuria in the younger males, you still pick up a few cancers. Macroscopic hematuria always needs investigation. Microscopic hematuria, usually, we'll come back to that. 
hematuria, imaging plus cystoscopy. Now, IVP has pretty much gone out of uh, use altogether because it didn't show early tumours. Ultrasound is a pretty good screening test. You'll pick up one, two centimetre cysts, solid lesions, stones. You'll pick up most things on an ultrasound. And it'll also pick up early bladder tumours. And it gives you some information about how big the chap's prostate is. So it's not a bad test. It's not as sensitive for small stones as CT. It might miss upper tract TCC, like TCC in the ureter or the renal pelvis. But that's a rare pathology, and, if it, and it will show you a more advanced TCC in the upper tract. So ultrasound's a pretty good screen. CT's better, of course, and it tells you a lot more about stones. Um, now, that's, and flexible cystoscopy. I, I was thinking driving down here today, I should have brought a flexible cystoscope along uh, and had it on the stand so you could take a look at it. It feels like a slightly thick catheter. So having a flexible cystoscopy is not a big deal. In fact, in the public system, when doing flexible cystoscopies, you have about four nurses assisting you. And it always struck me as a gross misuse of resource because it must be the most benign procedure you can do to somebody. You can cause far more harm with an angiocath. So <clears throat> cytology, that's still the only urinary test uh, that makes any guidelines. There are a whole lot of other biomarkers, and you know, you've possibly heard of a company called Pacific Edge, which uh, has been marketing a, a fairly expensive urinary test for bladder cancer. There are about 20 of these things. They've been out there for about 20 or 30 years. Uh, they're always just about to take off. Uh, none of them uh, meet the level of sensitivity of the good old Mark I eyeball at cystoscopy. So, the cytology is a poor screening test, but if you have a patient who's had macroscopic hematuria and they're a male and they smoke uh, and they have positive cytology, then they have bladder cancer. You can just about guarantee it. It's, it cytology is not necessarily sensitive for early cancers, low-grade cancers, but it's very specific. If you have positive cytology, you have bladder cancer. So who can skip cystoscopy? Well, there are a few patients, and we're talking about young patients with microscopic hematuria, no symptoms and no risk factors for cancer. Non-smokers, uh, people who don't work with uh, industrial dyes. Uh, now, that probably doesn't describe very many of the patients that uh, Bruce is kind of worrying about in this sort of presentation. Uh, Microscopic hematuria, we've got to bear in mind, on a, a, a urinalysis is not necessarily a terribly useful test. Uh, it's, it's not a very, um, you know, it can be easily contaminated. Prostate cancer is the other common urological cancer which you can miss. And uh, there may or may not be associated urinary symptoms. Early prostate cancer is in and of itself asymptomatic, uh, but there's often a, a coexisting BPH as well. Hematuria, not a very common presentation of prostate cancer itself, but there's about a 10% concordance between things like bladder cancer and prostate cancer. So it's in the guidelines that if you have hematuria, you should have your PSA checked. The traditional presentation of prostate cancer, chronic retention uh, with uremia, uh, lower abdominal mass from distended bladder, very rare. Pain, uh, lumbar back pain, radicular kind of pain, rare as a presentation. Now you've got to remember that PSA uh, is a fantastic tumour marker. Uh, now, not really here to talk about screening for prostate cancer, but as an anecdote, uh, a friend of mine who's an ophthalmologist uh, rang me up a few weeks ago, somewhat peeved that her mother's uh, man friend, who's an elderly guy, aged 80, has been seeing his GP for a couple of years with urinary symptoms, and this is his doctor's comment. Now, you shouldn't be this guy. Don't be this guy. 
It's a stupid thing to say. Um, and you're digging yourself a medico legal hole because by and by, uh, this chap's symptoms got worse and his doctor eventually did a rectal exam and lo and behold had a, an overtly malignant feeling prostate and a PSA of 150 and he's got metastatic, uh, you know, he's got widespread metastatic bone disease. So prostate cancer is the easiest cancer in the world to never miss. Uh, PSA is a fantastic tumour marker. Just listening to Eva talk about CA125, which isn't something I know anything about, uh, I bet the gynaecologist would love to have something for ovarian cancer that performed anything like as well as PSA does. Like any sort of screening test, there's always going to be an overlap with uh, benign pathology and normal variation, but pretty much as soon as you get to a PSA of 10 or higher, there's an even chance that man has prostate cancer. And once you get over 20, uh, he's virtually guaranteed to have prostate cancer in the absence of something like a raging urinary infection. So if the PSA is up, check your urinalysis, check the PSA again in a month if you like, but if it's still up, then he's probably got cancer. If his PSA is over 10, uh, if it's over 20, he probably has early nodal disease. If it's over 50, he's probably got metastatic disease. There's no other blood test like this in medicine. Now, disease detection isn't the same as screening, so I'm not going to talk about screening. That's a very different uh, subject, but you just need to get over the fact that PSA is an imperfect test. There's a fair amount of overlap between the guys who have large prostates and guys who have early cancer. And that's the tr one of the issues with PSA as a screening test. But once you get over 10, remember, cancer should very much be on the radar. Now, if your patient is elderly and frail, and he's there seeing you with some vague symptoms, and he's got a PSA of 12, plus or minus whether he has a slightly suspicious feeling prostate, you don't need to take a biopsy. You can have a reasonable discussion with him about the fact that you know, you're 80 years old, you've got a few other medical problems, uh, you might have an early prostate cancer, it's probably not going to impact on your longevity. Uh, you don't need to investigate that. Now, obviously it doesn't explain his presentation of vague abdominal symptoms and, and uh, then you're going to refer him back to, uh, to Adam or Alan. Um, Biopsy. Let, let's say the patient's younger and you do biopsy him. Biopsy doesn't necessarily lead to treatment. So if someone is classically, the classic sort of presentation of screening is around 65. If you have a 65 year old, he's still sexually active and he values that and he has very early low volume Gleason 6 cancer, you can probably leave him alone for a few years. This is an idea that's gained a lot of traction in the last five years. And there's no doubt that men were being over-treated in the first 10 or 15 years of the PSA era. Uh, interestingly, the Gleason grade is going out this year. It's going to be replaced by another system, which will be graded simply one to five. So Gleason six will drop down to a grade one. So it won't sound as bad, and perhaps uh, we can persuade uh, more urologists to leave these guys alone for the time being. Now, is the treatment worse than the disease, which is the other old uh, chestnut about prostate cancer? Well, sometimes. I mean, if you're over-treating somebody, yes. But on the other hand, dying with metastatic bone cancer is not great. And to uh, draw from uh, Alan's talk, it's nearly entirely preventable if we had a, even a loose degree of screening. The European uh, randomised study uh, that was published in the New England Journal a few years ago, they only screened every four years, and that was enough to drop the uh, mortality rate by 20%. So, it's, but with prostate cancer, it's not just about death rates. Unlike gastric cancer or pancreatic cancer or esophageal cancer, it doesn't kill you quickly. In fact, it kills you so slowly uh, that 
age often intervenes, and that's why it takes many, many years to see anything really changing in a screening study. But it's better, as a 75-year-old, to have EBRT to your prostate than it is to not have anything done at 80, present with bone disease, and then have to go on hormone therapy. Hmm. So <clears throat> I think I've timed out on that. There you go. Can you, you can, okay, I think we have to push this to make it go. Um, it is lunchtime, but I thought we'd just go for 10 minutes with the questions, because my idea was to have some Q&A. Um, if you've got questions, where's the roving mic? Roving mic over there, and or come up and stand here. So away you go. I'm Nita, GP. Um, when would you start screening for prostate cancer, and at what age would you stop? <laughs> uh, there's, there's pretty good evidence that actually it's only, if you're talking about pure population screening, it makes a difference up to the age of 65. This is in terms of mortality, remember. Let's, you know, it, because patients live for many years with prostate cancer. Uh, hormone therapy, if you go onto it with a relatively small volume of metastatic disease, you can box on for years and years and years. So you really need to, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to screen anybody, you could screen at 50, 55, 60, 65. You'd probably uh, virtually eliminate uh, metastatic prostate cancer. Question? Can oh well. Well. Uh, probably, you know, it depends whose guideline you read. I mean, uh, the American Urology Association guideline would be yearly. Uh, the US Preventative Task Force is never. Um, but probably every couple of years is quite a reasonable frequency of screening. We, we've got to remember, unlike uh, ovarian cancer, uh, prostate cancer, fairly silent disease, used to present advanced in 75% of cases, much like ovarian cancer. Now, in areas where there's a fair degree of whether there either is screening or there's de facto screening, that's swapped right around. The great majority of cancer is early. Uh, presentations like I used to see as a registrar with cord compression and uremia, much less common. Okay, do we have another question? I've just got a question for Alan. Um, can you just come up to the microphone if you want a question? Um, if we're going to give lots more colonoscopies, I think is right, and that's what's missing in New Zealand uh, for the bowel cancer, who's going to get them? How do, we, how do we target that? We can't do what the Americans do and give everybody a colonoscopy. Uh, well, there's no answer to that. It, it's a question in, in the country as to how much resource we're willing to, to put into this. I mean, if we do get national bowel cancer screening, which might you know, come in a couple of years if, the, if there's an election bribe, uh, it means uh, at least a 50% increase in colonoscopy volume, and that's a lot of people to, to train and a lot of uh, departments to, to gear up, and that will take uh, five or 10 years to, to happen. But I think it's what I said, you know, you're dealing with symptoms that aren't great, change in bowel habit, rectal bleeding, but and at the moment you're sort of just trying to select the, the ones that are the, you know, the worst rather than everybody in that setting, but if you had the, knew that your department would uh, accept these people, you'd refer a whole lot more. I think also um, in these sort of symposiums, most of my colleagues and myself have discouraged the use of fecal occult blood testing for evaluating symptoms. We've said, well, fecal occult bloods are all about bowel cancer screening programs and some, you know, testing the symptomatic patient is about your evaluation of the symptoms. Probably, and this is what happens in Australia, you, you have some symptoms, you get a fecal occult blood test, if anything's positive, you get a colonoscopy. I can't say that here because most of the departments that you deal with will turn those patients down because they just can't simply handle that volume. But if you could handle the volume, it's not a bad way of going. You'll pick up a few more. Well, that's what Mark Elwood used to say. If we just, if we just did uh, colonoscopies on people with positive alcohol bloods, we, that would be the best use of resources. In terms of diagnostic test theory, it makes complete sense. It's got a, its sensitivity and specificity is greater than 50%. Likelihood ratio is not great, but it's better than, more, it's better than it's guessing. <laughs> it's better than struggling with change in bowel habits. Yeah, actually. well, that's right. Mm. Yeah, question. 
Uh, yes, first, first two questions, really, if I may. Number one is a direct address to Adam. Um, my wife had a long history of uh, recurring upper abdominal pain, and um, uh, we did several uh, tests for Helicobacter, but they were all negative. The antibodies were negative. Finally, I got her to see a gastroenterologist, and um, he did an upper GI endoscopy, and she had a heavier infestation of HP, which required three lots of treatment to cure it. How common is that? Uh, well, I guess, is this going? We're off topic a bit in terms of cancer. Um, but yes, so, so blood tests can be negative, helicobacter serology, uh, um, you know, 10 or 15 percent of the, the time. And in terms of treatment, yes, our standard treatment is getting less effective now. Our amiprazole, amoxicillin, clofromycin used to be 90 percent plus. It's probably getting down to 80 percent. Once you fail on your first treatment, then each successive treatment has lower success rates. If you repeat the same thing again, you'll have very low success rate. So, you know, I see lots of people with uh, three attempts um, and just still can't get rid of the helicobacter. Uh, that's a whole topic in itself. The second question is addressed to Chris. Um, how often should one examine a man's back passage, DRE? Does it depend on age or symptoms or what? Look, if a guy has an abnormal DRE, if you think he has a suspicious DRE, you're probably right. Uh, it's very seldom I see someone uh, referred along with a, a suspicious DRE, and I disagree with the general practitioner. Sometimes you get those sort of prostates that are a little bit asymmetrical, a little bit wonky, not what necessarily malignant feeling. And often when you do a transrectal ultrasound on those guys, you find that they simply have a degree of asymmetric BPH, or they've got a few prostatic calculi. If you look at the literature, as soon as someone has an abnormal DRE, it doubles the chance that their elevated PSA reflects cancer. So if you've got a PSA of, say, 10, normal DRE, chance of having cancer is probably 30-40%. Abnormal DRE, chance of having cancer is probably 60-70%. If you take that up to 20, then the numbers would become more like, uh, you know, uh, normal DRE, big, big prostate, presumably. Uh, chance of cancer, probably still 30-40%. Abnormal DRE, PS, you know, suspicious DRE, PSA of 20, you've got cancer. You take it to the bank. Um, for the no guy with a normal PSA, or a mildly elevated PSA, the reality is doing a DRE probably doesn't make much difference. Because what you've, for things that are referred along for being suspicious, let's say not, you know, PSA 5, slightly suspicious DRE, a lot of the time, if they have a biopsy, the biopsy comes back positive on the other side anyway. You know, without, we, we know that if you biopsy men with a normal PSA in the normal range, you'll pick up cancers. They're just probably not biologically significant yet. So if you hate doing DREs, you... <laughs> no, they don't. Well, you know. Um... <laughs> yeah, look, most guys don't, but they'll kind of begrudgingly go along with it. You've got to inject a little levity into it. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Phil Gifford's writing a book at the moment on male health, and one of his good uh, quotes is that uh, he was told by a senior urologist, you know, it's not as if the urologist wants to do it either. You know, that after 10,000, it starts getting a little easier. <laughs> Loose head lens uh, still exists. Um, question for Lois. I was a bit alarmed at the symptoms of ovarian cancer because I think I might have a high pre-test probability of it. But my question is... Um, this is more getting a bit pathophysiological for a GP, but why the abdominal distension with um, ovarian cancer? Why is that predictive? Well, say the majority will present late, so you've got that sort of bloating that could be due to ascites, mm. or quite often if you've got tumour deposits on the bowel, you'll have some degree of bowel obstruction as well. So it's a combination. So it's a sign of, of being late. Yeah. 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 
Okay, folks. Well, I, I think uh, there's been a ton of stuff. Uh, in fact, I, I think we need to get these people back individually, really, is what I've realized. I hadn't realized there were so many moving parts, uh, you know, with all these different organ systems. When you, when you actually get each individual put, talking about the multitude of organs they're dealing with, it's actually, uh, there's a lot of moving parts. But anyway, I'd just like to thank everybody. I uh, thank the panel. Uh, I think it's been a great session.